Hi, I'm Carrie Wade, Senior Manager of Global Scientific Engagement at Philip Morris, and today I will be discussing nicotine flux as a regulatory approach to newer tobacco products. Recent technological advances have enabled the development of several novel nicotine delivery systems as a way to deliver nicotine without combustion and to help smokers move away from cigarettes. There is a recognized need to establish regulatory standards to ensure that these new products do not expose users to unnecessary toxicants. In addition, regulatory standards have been proposed to mitigate the abuse liability of these products through targeting nicotine delivery to the user. Towards that goal, several regulatory bodies have established nicotine limits in e-cigarette liquids with the aim of bringing parity to cigarettes and e-cigarettes in terms of the amount of nicotine they deliver. However, the utility of such a simplistic target has been called into question as many factors beyond nicotine content influence delivery. As such, nicotine flux has recently been suggested as a more appropriate regulatory target. Nicotine flux, the rate of nicotine emission from the device, is influenced by many parameters, including the power of the device, puff duration, nicotine concentration, and the ratio of propylene glycol to vegetable glycerin, the main excipients in the e-liquids. The Center for the Study of Tobacco Products Nicotine Flux Workgroup has evaluated data and trends of flux for several products administered by different routes. This concept is now being evaluated in the clinic. However, similar to nicotine concentration standards, these parameters assume a direct relationship between nicotine emission and delivery while also assuming that a high flux product has a higher abuse liability than a low flux product. Here we provide a brief perspective on the applicability of nicotine flux for human exposures and highlight the importance of considering clinical pharmacology related paradigms when attempting to set nicotine ceilings. A paper published by the Nicotine Flux Work Group defined flux as nicotine yield per second Depending on the route of administration, this may be dependent upon puff duration for inhaled products or duration of use for the product that are delivered through buccal administration, sublim sublingual administration, and transdermal products. Using product information, we were able to calculate nicotine flux from a variety of products with a various routes of administration. Previous evaluations across products yielded similar results. However, we extended this to include more routes of administration from various tobacco products and nicotine replacement therapies. The results showed that nicotine flux was lowest from the nicotine patch and highest from nasal and mouth sprays, with consumer products like e-cigarettes, heat not burn, and oral products in the middle. As flux is defined by the dose of nicotine and duration of product use, we compared the contribution of each. Nicotine flux is poorly related to the dose for products administered by different routes. For example, a dose of one milligram can be delivered at different nicotine flux that are several orders of magnitude different. Evaluating the relationship between nicotine flux and nicotine dose through various routes of delivery, we found almost no relationship between nicotine flux from the device and total dose to the user based on studies that provided enough detail for us to assess such a relationship. However, based on products that are currently available today, we did find an inverse relationship between duration of product use and nicotine flux, where the highest flux products are those that are intended for a shorter duration of use. The lack of a relationship between flux and nicotine delivery may be due to the many factors that influence nicotine delivery to the user, but are not accounted for in flux. Particularly important factors for inhaled products like e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products are protonation of the e-liquid, and particle size distribution. Nicotine flux does not consider these factors, but both influence nicotine dose and delivery rate. Since nicotine flux is being calculated for product characterization, we examined if increased nicotine flux is associated with greater systemic exposure or pharmacokinetic parameters. As nicotine flux may not fully capture nicotine dose or final delivery, we propose that the most relevant parameter that captures a product-specific metric is the rate of systemic nicotine delivery given by a maximum concentration of nicotine reached in the blood over the time it takes to reach the maximum concentration, or Cmax over Tmax. As we can see here, there is little relationship between nicotine flux and Cmax over Tmax, but a stronger relationship between product type and Cmax over Tmax. For example, the nicotine inhaler in mouth and nasal sprays have similar or higher nicotine flux than cigarettes or e-cigarettes, but given the differential aerosol physiochemical properties, deposition patterns, and absorption, 
the resulting PK and Cmax over Tmax are very different. Furthermore, a rise in the nicotine flux for cigarettes or e-cigarettes did not result in an increase in Cmax over Tmax. Another way to look at this is how products may predict quitting or switching success. We examined studies that reported 52-week quitting or switching success as a function of either nicotine flux, a measurement of nicotine emissions from the product, or as a, as a function of Cmax over Tmax. We found almost no relationship between nicotine flux and 52-week quitting or switching success. 10% quit success can be achieved using a placebo, and a change in nicotine flux by several orders of magnitude did not meaningfully increase the quit success. However, we did find that Cmax over Tmax was positively associated with 52-week quitting or switching success. When considering regulations around newer tobacco products such as e-cigarettes and heat not burn products, there is a need to balance the benefits of these products for people who may smoke, who smoke and may use them to switch, with the potential risks of these products to people who would not otherwise use tobacco, but may initiate with these new products. The data presented here show that nicotine flux is a poor predictor of nicotine delivery and is not a suitable parameter to regulate nicotine delivery or abuse liability. Thank you for your attention.